Hi, good afternoon. It is great to have uh, uh, everybody here. Uh, I'm going to, my name is Andrew Murtha. I'm the George and Sadie Hyman Professor of uh, China Studies here at SAIS. Uh, and I'm the, also the director of the SAIS China Global Research Center. And I am delighted to be able to invite all of you to uh, the second installment of the China Methodology Workshop series, Relearning the Lost Arts of China Scholarship. Uh, and before I introduce our speakers, I just want to uh, thank all the people who have been just so instrumental in, in, in making all of this happen, uh, both pre-production, uh, post-production, and throughout the, um, the event itself. So I'd like to thank Gabrielle Rayner, Mo Elahi, Pedro Matias, Ellie Rostum, and Amanda uh, Nepomuceno, and of course, Hosta Coleman. Uh, and anybody else who I've left out, uh, I do apologize, but this is the work of many. Uh, I am beyond delighted to introduce our two guests today. Um, I'm going to read their, uh, their bios and try to do this as quickly as possible so that we don't lose any, um, any time. Uh, we'll have a hard stop at 5 p.m. and uh, the format will be, I will introduce the speakers, uh, Dr. Miller will, uh, will begin, and then uh, Professor Fusmith will, uh, will follow up, uh, and then we'll see uh, what kind of time we have left, uh, whether or not I will moderate a, a brief discussion or whether we'll go straight to the Q&A. Please do not hesitate to send questions as they come up rather than uh, at the beginning, beginning of the Q&A period because uh, we want to be able to um, uh, bundle uh, uh, as many as we can so that we get to everybody's. Okay, enough stage managing. Um, so uh, Professor, uh, Doc, Professor Joe Fusmith is Professor of International Relations and Political Science at the Boston University Party School. He is the author uh, or editor of eight books including most recently, The Logic and Limits of Political Reform in China. Uh, actually, that's not, no, the, the, um, the most recent one is, well, uh, it, uh, others include China Since Tiananmen, China Today, uh, China Tomorrow, uh, Elite Politics in Contemporary China, Dilemmas of Reform in China, Political Conflict and Economic Debate, and party, state, and local elites in Republican China, merchant organizations, and politics in Shanghai. He is one of the seven regular contributors to the China Leadership Monitor, uh, uh, a quarterly web publication analyzing current developments in China. And the format of the China Leadership Monitor has changed, uh, but the, the, the older issues uh, are, are online and are must-reads. Uh, Professor Fu Smith travels to China regularly and is active uh, in the Association for Asian Studies and the American Political Science Association. His articles have appeared in such journals as Asian Survey, Comparative Studies in Society and History, The China Journal, The China Quarterly, Current History, The Journal of Contemporary China, Problems of Communism, and Modern China. He's an associate at the John King Fairbank Center for East Asian Studies at Harvard University and the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future at Boston University. Professor Few Smith's areas of expertise include comparative politics as well as Chinese domestic politics and foreign policy. And I have to, I'm gonna age all of us right now, but uh, one of the most uh, influential uh, books I read the first semester uh, of my graduate school uh, experience in the doctoral program at Michigan was Dilemmas of Reform in China, uh, and it was very much a foundational text in my understanding of elite politics. Um, Dr. Alice Lyman Miller is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and lecturer in East Asian Studies at Stanford. Dr. Miller first joined the Hoover Institution in 1999 as a visiting fellow. She also served as senior lecturer in the Department of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California from 1999 to 2014. Before coming to Stanford, Dr. Miller taught at the School of Advanced International Studies, uh, an institution most of you know very, very well, uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, from 1980 to 2000. 
she was an associate professor of China studies and for most of that period, the director of China studies. Uh, so she also uh, has left some very, very big shoes for me to fill. Um, she also held a joint appointment as adjunct associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins from 1996 to 1999 and as adjunct lecturer in the Department of Government, Georgetown University from 1996 to 1998. From 1974 to 1990, Dr. Miller worked in the Central Intelligence Agency as a senior analyst in Chinese foreign policy and domestic politics, and as branch and division chief, supervising analysis on China, North Korea, Indochina, and Soviet policy in East Asia. Dr. Miller has lived and worked in Taiwan, Japan, and of course, the People's Republic of China. Her research focuses on Chinese foreign policy and domestic politics and on international relations of Asia. Since 2001, she has served as general editor and regular contributor to the China Leadership Monitor, um, which offers uh, authoritative assessments of trends in China's, Chinese leadership politics and policy to US policymakers and the general public, and certainly uh, the, um, the scholarly class. Uh, she was working on a new book, um, uh, tentatively entitled The Evolution of Chinese Grand Strategy, 1550 to the Present, which brings a historical perspective to bear on China's rising power in the contemporary international order. Dr. Miller has published extensively on foreign policy issues dealing with China, including several in the Hoover Digest. Uh, uh, others include the Foreign Policy Outlook of China's Third Generation Elite with Liu Xiaohong, uh, in the Making of Chinese Foreign and Security Policy in the Era of Reform, edited by uh, uh, Mike Lanton, Late Imperial State uh, in Feshre for Franz Michael, uh, The Modern Chinese State, and Is China Unstable in Is China Unstable, uh, edited by David Shambaugh. She's the author of Science and Dissent in Post Mao China, The Politics of Knowledge, uh, University of Washington Press, 1996, and with SAIS Professor Richard uh, Witt, Becoming Asia, Change and Continuity in Asian International Relations Since World War II. Dr. Miller won the Distinguished Teaching Award at Johns Hopkins University in 1994-1995 and the Schieffelin Award for Excellence in Teaching at the Naval Postgraduate School in 2012. Uh, she has been interviewed on Voice of America, National Public Radio, CNN, and in Business Week the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, as well as press from Japan, Taiwan, and the PRC. Dr. Miller graduated from Princeton University in 1966, receiving a BA in Oriental Studies. She earned an MA and a PhD in History from George Washington University in 1969. Uh, and it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce our, uh, both of our speakers, uh, Alice, I believe you will go first, so I will mute myself and hand over the microphone to you, and I am just delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, to let's start off, let me share screen here. Okay, can everybody see this? I guess everybody's muted, so they can't. Well, um, let me start off by saying that instead of uh, referring to the lost arts of, of China scholarship, I want to talk about China watching. And by that, I mean the art of understanding what's going on in China right now. Uh, it, the methods that I'll describe as the classical method apply uh, very well uh, to researching pre previous times in contemporary Chinese affairs. Uh, but the focus of it, uh, at least as I was taught it and the way uh, I uh, have always used it, is to focus on what's exactly going on in China now. Uh, and so um, that's going to be uh, the thrust of um, the way I describe what I'm calling the classical method. Joe and I have div divided up the labor a little bit. I'm going to offer a broad framework in which to understand uh, the classical method and uh, the premises. Uh, that justify its use. And then Joe will give you some practical tips on using it, how the, how the practice, how the method actually works. Uh, so uh, with that, I uh, just suggest uh, that uh, the classical method uh, might be called media analysis uh, was the mainstay of analysis of China in the 1950s and 60s on into the 70s. Um, and um, uh, 
uh, it's the, the premium put on it uh, is understandable in terms of the sources that have been available uh, for at least Americans to study China. And so uh, if you look uh, at the sources available to study contemporary Chinese affairs in the 1950s through the 1966 on the eve of the Cultural Revolution, uh, there were Chinese media, PRC media themselves, independent Hong Kong press offered some insight to affairs uh, in China itself. There were a number of emigres into Hong Kong uh, that could be interviewed and to uh, as to uh, what their experience was in China. And there are a few foreign visitors uh, to China who could offer insight into uh, what they saw and in, in, uh, into the meetings that they had with Chinese leaders. These were relatively few in those days uh, because China's uh, international relations were severely curtailed under the American policy of containment. China had relatively few diplomatic uh, relationships and therefore foreign visitors uh, um, uh, and including the United States, uh, there's simply word any. Edgar Snow uh, went in, I think, 1959, again in 1970 or 71, but he did so illegally, uh, at least under American law. Andre Malraux, uh, the, the French intellectual, uh, went in, I think, 19... 65 or 66, right after Paris normalized relations with Beijing in 1964. But that was basically uh, the uh, main sources that were available to try to understand Chinese leadership politics, foreign policy, and uh, other affairs. The Cultural Revolution um, opened up new sources, uh, in particular, uh, the Red Guard newspapers and the big character wall posters, the Da Zibao. Um, offered uh, insight into some aspects of leadership politics, um, uh, but basically uh, the array of sources that were available um, uh, were pretty much the same as in the previous period. Um, AFP, the Agence France Presse, uh, operated in China after normalization with Paris in 1964, and there were Japanese reporters uh, reporting uh, in the Cultural Revolution period. I recall uh, reading about Japanese reporters wearing miners' helmets at night to go out and read all the big character wall posters in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but basically, our sources to understand contemporary China were still severely limited, and PRC media remained uh, the mainstay of analysis. The situation changed, especially for the United States and most Western countries at the early 70s. And so from the early 70s forward, a whole array of new sources became available uh, that really changed uh, the way uh, people studied uh, contemporary China. And so now uh, we Americans and other foreigners had contacts with PRC officials, uh, with Chinese academics, uh, Chinese traveled abroad. It was possible to do uh, field work and take residence in China uh, to study uh, China's local politics and so forth. And then most recently uh, in the last 15 years or so, new media have appeared, uh, which supplement uh, avenues to understand what's going in China. So the priority attached to analyzing Chinese media back in the 50s and 60s was basically a consequence of the very restricted access, uh, the avenues of information that we had to understand China. Now, um, the approach to using PRC media in those days to understand what was going on, Chinese leadership form and so forth, rested on a discipline uh, that's broadly called propaganda analysis, a nice Cold War term, but it conveyed uh, basically what the approach was about. It rested on the observation uh, that China's open media were subject to review and control, at least at some level. And because the information presented in the media therefore reflected priorities of the regime, it was possible to reason backwards uh, from the presentation of information in the media uh, to uh, inquire at and analyze uh, Chinese authorities and politics and so forth. These methods uh, applied to China beginning in the 1950s were not new. They had been applied uh, in uh, World War II era in the study of Nazi Germany. Uh, and um, uh, the United States government set up in the spring of 1940 an organization called the Foreign Broadcast Information Service uh, to begin to monitor German uh, and then Japanese and Italian uh, radio broadcasts and then to analyze the content. And several figures uh, in those days who became prominent in American social sciences later worked in that unit. These were Nathan Leitus, Hans Speyer, Edward Schills, and Alexander George. Uh, George was famous for writing a book 
uh, analyzing um, uh, Goebbels' diaries, uh, the, the chief of propaganda in the Nazi regime, and comparing it to the analysis during the war years uh, to uh, assess how accurate the analysis had been. The techniques had always been applied, uh, so I think going back to the Riga school uh, in um, the 1920s to understanding affairs in the Soviet Union uh, and um, uh, several um, analysts in the 50s and 60s were famous in applying this kind of analysis to the study of Soviet politics. Um, uh, uh, people like Myron Rush, Carl Linden, who worked in FBIS and then uh, taught at Washington University, uh, the French reporter at Le Monde, uh, Michel Tatu, uh, all practiced this uh, to a fine art. And with regard to China, um, this was the staple of analyzing China, both in academe, but also in government. And government had several analysts who were uh, 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 excellent uh, practitioners of this art, people like Art Cohen, Donald Zagoria, who may, whose name you may know from a book on the Sino-Soviet conflict in the 1950s and early 60s, Richard Wick, uh, who worked at FBIS. Uh, he was uh, my, one of my colleagues uh, and a mentor. Um, and also taught at SICE, I think, as Andy uh, mentioned. Now, uh, how this worked in ancient time, how this method worked in ancient time, and by ancient times, I do mean the 50s and 60s and, and some, to some extent in the 70s. Uh, the way I'd like to explain this is by putting in the context of the three main information systems uh, that were uh, uh, at work in Chinese politics in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And in doing that, I want to focus on two. One is the internal media, the naval publications, print publications, and then uh, the public media, the Gongkai media uh, that uh, everybody's familiar with. And I'd like to delineate the differences and purposes that they served in the political system and then focus on uh, why uh, the open media offer avenues into understanding Chinese politics, foreign policy, and so forth, uh, the basic methodolog methodological presumptions. Now, uh, China, 50s and 70 major information systems, one, confidential documents, second, the Nebu public publications that I just mentioned, then, of course, the public or open media. Each of these had its own channels of dissemination, and they operated under different constraints. They served different purposes in the political system, and they had their own distinctive uh, content. The confidential documents I'll be quite brief about because we don't know all that much about them. They were classified and therefore not generally available uh, to study. Uh, they operated in a basically three-tiered uh, classification system similar to the American government's uh, system. Uh, and they were uh, circulated within the bureaucratic uh, institutes of the Communist Party, the PLA, uh, and, and the Chinese state. Uh, the most important of these, for example, was the central documents, the um, uh, so-called Zhongfa, the central committee documents. Uh, these were issued several times over the course of the year, and every once in a while, they would publicize one of these, and it gave us a glimpse into these kinds of documents and the kinds of things that they addressed. There were categories, uh, uh, other categories of these sorts of documents, and some of us spent a lot of time trying to sort out the hierarchy of these kinds of documents to see what sort of insight that might give us into the priority of the various issuances. And I recall Ken Lieberthal did a nice little book um, uh, compiling uh, the, all the references that we had to these classified documents, which wasn't very many. The internal publications, the Nebu publications, uh, is an enormous system of uh, publication materials circulated, uh, not in public. Uh, their circulation was restricted. They're not technically classified, uh, but they were not available in generally in public. All of them normally would carry a warning against open circulation um, and um, 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 advising that they not be uh, left around in public and so forth. The, these publications were issued by most institutions in the Chinese political system. Uh, many uh, institutions uh, published more than one, uh, and they circulated throughout the system to provide information uh, uh, about the goings on within the institutions and more broadly. Access to these publications was mainly through your work unit. Uh, and so if you worked at um, uh, some uh, state-owned enterprise or at the foreign ministry, you had access to the Nebu publications uh, of your own institution, plus those that circulated within the institution as well. Uh, 
Also, uh, at least back in uh, the good old days, in ancient times, the Xinhua bookstores had a separate room uh, that carried uh, Nebu publications. And I worked briefly in the American embassy in 81, uh, and you could wander in there and wander around and look at the Nebu publications and maybe even once in a walk out and, uh, or you were stopped and saying, you're not supposed to be in there. Uh, so uh, these were publications uh, that, uh, whose, whose dissemination was controlled. The volume and diversity of these institutions is truly enormous. It's an enormous university of materials. There are documentary series uh, that uh, featured, among other things, in-house collections of leaders' speeches and uh, formal documents. Uh, there were um, uh, publications that carried ongoing policy proposals and debates about the proposals. There were reference materials supply, uh, intended to supply general information uh, to help uh, the reader make sense of, uh, of what's going on in the world. These included, uh, most famously, Tsang Kao Xiaoxi reference information. Uh, this was a tabloid four-page publication that had uh, circulation more than twice the size of People's Day. Uh, it's a very common publication um, uh, that basically was translations of foreign media on events uh, in China and out of, of interest uh, to uh, the readership. A more restricted publication, Tsang Liao, uh, was compiled uh, for the top leadership, maybe the top 200 leaders. They were red, so-called red stripe publications uh, that was a much more um, carefully selected um, um, compendium of materials uh, for of interest directly to the top leadership. Both of these uh, publications were, were compiled by the Xinhua News Agency. Uh, internal publications also included unit periodicals of various kinds. The Central Party School, for example, had uh, one of its publications, Li Luan Dong Tai, carried ongoing speeches and articles on ongoing debates about ideology. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, obviously, there were many of these. Uh, they also published books. Um, in 1981, I got a hold of a, a Nebu collection of Shen Yun speeches from 1956 to 62. Um, and uh, that were published for reference with, uh, with respect to ongoing debates about economic reform. Uh, Li Rei, uh, Mao's former secretary, published a record of the uh, Lushan meetings in 1950, the famous Lushan plenum in 1959. Um, and so um, uh, uh, books on politically sensitive subjects uh, were frequently published within the Nebu system. Also, they carry translations of foreign books, all kinds of foreign books. I have myself, of um, uh, uh, a translation, uh, uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, uh, that uh, was translated uh, for Nebu and then later in the 80s uh, made available for public publication. So this is an enormous universe of materials uh, whose scope is really hard to get a hold of. The open or Gunkai media are what we think of as PRC media most broadly. And this is an enormous system of information uh, media uh, that includes not only print publications, but also broadcast and more recently electronic media. Uh, it features um, among the broadcast uh, media, Beijing Radio, uh, which was Beijing's national radio, still operates in those days. Uh, Beijing Radio uh, broadcast in 38 foreign languages and five Chinese dialects. It had a national news program at 6 a.m., I'm sorry, 6 p.m., uh, that was relayed simultaneously to the provinces. All of the provinces and most local cities had their own radio stations, uh, which carried uh, hookups from the national uh, radio system, as well as their own local programming in the early 80s. Um, uh, televisions uh, began to take off and become ubiquitous as well. The Xinhua News Agency uh, has been since the 40s uh, the uh, Chinese Communist official news agency. It's officially under the state council, uh, um, and so it's the state's news agency, and it operates like news agencies like AFP, I'm sorry, AFP and AP and uh, so forth. Reuters uh, does it, that is, it reports, provides reports for publication in uh, the Chinese press. Uh, Xinhua uh, has uh, its main file in Chinese, but it also offers files um, in, in those days in English, Russian, Japanese, Arabic, and French. Uh, there are two associated uh, news agencies that carried refined files aimed at overseas Chinese communities in Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, overseas. The print media um, um, also um, 
grew rapidly under the People's Republic. Uh, the figures here uh, go from 1952 down through 1970, and you'll see the ups and downs. Uh, 296 newspapers in 1952 reached upwards of 364 on the eve of the Great Leap in the three bitter years, and then receded to 273, uh, and 1965 was back up to uh, 343. Uh, but you can gather the impact or gain the impact to the great proletarian cultural revolution on what was available in terms of what was circulating publicly. Uh, newspapers were reduced to simply 42 uh, by 1970. And there are similar fears uh, for periodicals, journals and magazines, and also for books. The newspapers included nationally circulating newspapers, obviously People's Daily, uh, the Army's newspaper, Jeff Hong Jun Bao, uh, the uh, National Trade Union Federation's newspaper, Gung Ren Er Bao, uh, the um, Guangming Er Bao, uh, which was a newspaper uh, associated with the Third Front during the Civil War years, but was taken over to become uh, a United Front newspaper under the People's Republic and carried uh, um, mostly culture and intellectual affairs uh, uh, reporting. Uh, Jingzhi Urbao, uh, published formerly by the State Economic Commission, um, uh, and a whole array of other newspapers. The provinces and locales had their own newspapers. Um, Shanghai had two, um, and uh, local newspapers included things like the Beijing Wanbao, uh, four-page tabloid uh, published in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that was the site uh, for this famous three-family village uh, columns uh, written, um, uh, carrying, as carrying commentaries critical of the Great Leap and Mao Zedong's leadership. Famous, of course, important news for politically in China. Um, in those days, it was published daily and had six pages um, and uh, carried no advertising. That changed as we moved into the 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, this was the first place to look uh, for uh, significant political uh, information. In the 1980s, they began publishing an international uh, edition, uh, which was interesting because it was in traditional rather than simplified characters aimed at overseas Chinese communities. And uh, in the United States, it was available for home delivery. For several years, I had a home subscription myself. Now, in those days, uh, this universe of materials that was gleaned from or available for analysis uh, from the public media, uh, the Gunkai media, uh, was uh, large, but uh, not enormous as was possible uh, for, in this case, an American government institution, the Foreign Bro Broadcast Information Service, uh, to try to translate uh, the materials that were deemed relevant to ongoing intelligence and um, uh, foreign policy uh, community interests. And so FBIS published a daily report. It was one of eight daily reports that the agency published. Uh, and in this case, it carried uh, everything um, relevant uh, to ongoing uh, current day politics, military affairs, economy, and foreign policy, all in one convenient uh, packet of translations, usually somewhere between 60 and 80 pages, uh, five days a week. It was also available publicly. Uh, and so while the intelligence community and uh, the American government uh, could read in translation a uh, very current stuff uh, from PRC media, the public could too. Uh, and so um, um, uh, uh, libraries and China studies um, uh, departments and a lot of universities had long files of these um, uh, to make it available to students. And because um, uh, reading in English was faster for most of us um, than reading in Chinese. Um, this green book became the staple of government and academic analysis. If you go through the footnote of public publications back in the 60s, you'll see the FBIS daily report cited. Regrettably, uh, it stopped publication in the mid 90s for reasons that we can talk about later. Now, the question I want to pose is, why are there two systems? Why have this enormous universe of internal publications, but also this open system of information? Uh, both of these are enormous in terms of scope uh, and uh, volume. Uh, they both consumed enormous resources. They're both available uh, through people's work units. When you went to your political study sessions Saturday mornings at your work unit, uh, you saw and studied uh, stuff from both uh, materials, both from the Nebu system, but also the Gunkai system. Uh, and so there may be um, Nebu publications on some current topic uh, that would you, you'd be provided for reference, and then you could find out what the party's line was uh, by reading the People's Daily analysis of it or a commentary on it. But that simply poses the question, why two systems? Uh, 
The answer that I've always uh, offered, uh, and I have to say, I've never heard this confirmed by anybody from the PRC that I've ever talked to, but it seems to me that the answer uh, that why there are two systems was that they serve different purposes in uh, the political system. The internal network of publications, the NABU materials, the dissemination was controlled. It's not strictly classified, but it was not available publicly. You had to get it through your work unit uh, or through the appropriate internal channels. The content in these publications is open. Uh, it's not censored um, and it carried a wide diversity of opinions and ideas. Uh, and uh, um, uh, that contrasted with the open media in which the dissemination is public, uh, the Chinese, uh, state wanted everybody uh, to get uh, the uh, public media, and so dissemination was everywhere, uh, but the content was controlled. And so the two systems had different dissemination patterns and different approaches to what was published within them. I summarize this by saying the internal media published uh, the so-called news. You got the information there. You needed to understand what's going on. But the open media conveyed the party's line, what the party wanted you to understand about its approach to whatever the issue was uh, or um, uh, uh, so forth. And so from that perspective, the internal media I'm proposing served the process of policy formulation and deliberation. Uh, the open media served the process of explaining the policy once the policy has been in mobile population, mobilizing the population to support it. So. Um, uh, this is a uh, parallel uh, set of uh, information systems uh, that serve very different purposes um, in uh, the political order. Again, um, everybody uh, could get access through their work unit to the internal system, uh, but the content uh, and the content was not controlled. And opinions on all sorts of issues could be voiced as long as you had sufficient standing within the political unit, the relevant unit, uh, to have your views uh, published. The open media, by contrast, are public, and everything in it is subject to review, at least at some level, by the publication's editors, uh, by the writers themselves who self-censored, uh, and ultimately by the propaganda department of the Chinese Communist Party, and also even by top-level leaders. There were several instances in those days where it was observed, observed that high-level leaders, including Mao and Zhou Enlai, the prime minister, and Deng Xiaoping, personally reviewed some material that would appear later in the open media. In the early 70s, when Henry Kissinger would go uh, to Beijing and meet with Zhou Enlai, they'd have talks uh, through much of the day, um, each uh, negotiating team on opposite sides of the table, and they would take breaks. And it was observed uh, that when they took breaks, the Xinhua news guy would walk in and hand Zhou Enlai a sheaf of uh, draft um, dispatches to be published in the Xinhua news agency, and Zhou would work through them uh, line by line, uh, the, the dispatches that were relevant to uh, the negotiations underway. We also have copies of uh, draft Xinhua um, and People's Daily uh, commentaries that were personally reviewed by Mao, his uh, handwriting in the margins, commenting on it, and so forth. So the point here is the internal media are not authoritative. They don't speak for the regime. They're simply there to provide information for the ongoing political process. The open media, by contrast, are authoritative in some measure, and especially at the higher levels, they do speak for the Communist Party and for the Chinese state. The agency uh, that manages this process uh, at the very top, of course, is the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party's propaganda department these days. And I think in 1996, they decided in English to call it the publicity department, uh, but it's still the good old propaganda department. And it's supervised um, through its networks and all of the media, uh, what appeared in those media by uh, directives outlining topics and the way they should be treated and so forth. Uh, Xi Zhongshun uh, was the director of the propaganda department in 53-54, and as he's pictured here with uh, one of his sons who had particular uh, political promise down the road. Uh, you may recognize a young Xi Jinping uh, here. Now, uh, this process of review uh, could um, um, bring about an amazing consistency uh, in treatment of uh, almost everything in the media. Uh, the media and the open system were viewed carefully uh, to ensure uh, that there were no glitches, no mistakes, and so forth. And I like to use a very trivial example of how this uh, consistency in media um, um, was obvious uh, uh, to the point of mind-numbing triviality. 
Um, the so-called four modernizations, you may remember, uh, were enunciated at the third NPC by Zhou Enlai in 1964. Uh, they were dropped during the Cultural Revolution, but then brought back at the fifth, fourth NPC uh, by Zhou Enlai in January 1975. At that uh, NPC and his report on the work of the State Council, he called on China to build a modern socialist country with a modern agriculture, modern industry, modern s and and a modern national defense by the year 2000. Chinese media repeated that injunction millions of times between 1975 uh, over the next several years, but suddenly in February 1950, February 1981, they stopped um, re reciting in exactly that order. Instead, instead, they began to talk about China building a modern socialist country with a modern industry, modern agriculture, modern s and and modern national defense by the year 2000. And thereafter, for millions of times, they recited that formula in exactly the same way. Now, this was a change they, the media did not bother to explain, um, but the consistencies here underscored the significance of it. And we're entitled to wonder, well, why? Why would you shift modern agriculture and modern industry into and, and modern industry and modern agriculture? Again, they've never explained it, uh, but um, it invites inquiry into what they did uh, based on the consistency with which it had been repeated in one pattern up to 1981 and then in a new formula thereafter. So uh, why two systems? Uh, the point is simply uh, that the internal media assists the process of policy formulation. They circulate perspectives, proposals, debates, uh, uh, relevant information, and so forth. And after a policy decision has been made, the open media uh, explain the policy and uh, try to um, uh, enlist the population's uh, um, support for it and assist in implementation of it. And so because of that uh, place of the open media uh, in uh, this policy process, uh, the idea of basic idea of propaganda analysis is simply to reason backward uh, from what's appearing uh, in the media um, uh, to guess at these priorities, the editorial and policy priorities that shape the way it was presented in the media. And so by comparing the substantive content of media over time, and in particular context, we can uh, perhaps infer uh, uh, valid conclusions about the regime's intentions, about its priorities, and about the degree of consensus on some issue or another. That's basically uh, the process. Now, uh, to do this required very careful tracking of media themes uh, and formulations across time and context. You couldn't, uh, for one thing, it made going on vacation difficult because it meant when you came back, you had to fill in the gap and the flow of information uh, that you missed while you were away. Uh, it re required uh, consistent uh, control over the appearance of themes and for formulations across time to be able to make judgments about its importance and uh, about deviations from it. And so what this meant was big files. You have to have control over what's been said in the past in order to judge uh, the importance of information being presented uh, in the present. It's useful to have long experience and memories at it, and you have to be patient. Uh, it is a uh, time-consuming effort, but it does pay off in the end. When you do notice changes in theme, uh, changes, shifts in the authority of comment, and some new formulation underway, uh, there are possible explanations that um, uh, need to be considered. First and foremost, it might mean that the regime has a new position on whatever the issue is, and therefore the policies change, and therefore there's a new formulation. Uh, they're announcing it with a higher level of authority in, in uh, public commentary, and they're addressing it with themes and ideas. It also could be that it's just a response to a new situation. It's the context that changed. Uh, China and the United States have established diplomatic relations and therefore will begin to talk about the United States in the public media in ways that we didn't before that time. Or, and this was the tricky one, media practices may have changed. And the value of long experience and big files is, is that uh, it enables you to observe when they stop using some type of commentary in favor of a new one. Uh, and so um, uh, you have to be awake to the basic idea that they're presenting information in different ways than they have before. Now, that was the classical uh, and uh, people like Joe and I and lots of other people and people in academia spent huge amounts of time devoted to trying to do exactly that. It was the mainstay of analysis of contemporary China back in those days. 
So the question is, is it still feasible? And is it still worth doing? There are several uh, changes uh, since the 80s and especially more recently uh, that might uh, lead one to think that maybe uh, it's not as practical as it was before. For one thing, uh, there's been a slow erosion on the NABU publications. There are still lots of NABU publications, uh, but the uh, restrictions on them have become much looser. Sankao Xiaoshi, which used to be a restricted publication, you can now pick up at newsstands. Uh, and um, it's, it's, it's technically not an open publication, but it's now available easily. Also, the state itself uh, and the party have retreated from areas of uh, activity uh, that, it pre that were previously highly politicized and therefore subject to the full-scale control of media presentation um, and, um, and uh, therefore have become depoliticized. The media themselves have become much more prolific and commercialization in some instances have taken over as a new, new motivation for publishing. And so this raises questions about the validity of the degree of control uh, been exercised in PRC media today that might raise questions of the validity of the approach, the traditional method today. And then finally, there are the new media, the internet uh, and the various social media uh, that have emerged since respectively since the mid nineties and 2006 or 2007. Um, to get a, grasp of the scale of publications that have become available since the Cultural Revolution. These figures go down only to 2003, um, uh, but you can see from the scale of print publications here, uh, they've gone from 42 uh, newspapers uh, in 1970 to over 2000 by 2003. Uh, actually, the numbers of newspapers, I think, have been retreating thanks to the internet, but it's still a huge number. The number of books uh, has gone from a little under 5,000 uh, to over 190,000, and that's only um, uh, as of 2003. I did a survey, um, I'll come back to that. Uh, the kinds of periodicals that are available these days uh, covers the enormous range of topics and materials, no matter what area uh, that you may be interested in, uh, um, um, society, economy, politics, military, uh, international affairs, and so forth. There are journals and newspapers that are available to study them. Books, this is a survey I did back in 1995, and it's pretty much the same today. Gives you the number of books published in 1995 in various topics. And you can uh, see uh, the, revel, um, the rel rel relative attention given to Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, 104 books uh, published in 1995 compared uh, to uh, other uh, topics like culture, education, and sports, almost 42,000 and so forth. The point here is simply uh, that uh, in whatever your topic uh, that you're interested in these days, there is a journal and lots of books available uh, to study uh, the issue that was simply not the case back in the ancient, uh, ancient times. The new media um, also offer new avenues into Chinese society, um, especially the internet. Um, and the social media, the chat rooms and so forth app, offer av avenues of insight into Chinese society that were simply not available uh, previously. And so all of these uh, two avenues, they may be shrinking Xi Jinping, uh, but uh, these all raised questions uh, for a while about the utility of the traditional method and whether or not it's worth pursuing. But I would suggest to you uh, that it is, even without uh, Xi Jinping's increasing restrictions on, um, on media and other aspects of political life in China today, um, this method still works uh, because the, uh, the uh, regime has always maintained very close control and um, uh, um, uh, management of critical sectors and over media uh, that are central to the regime's pres presentation of its media. And that is to say the Xinhua News Agency, People's Daily, Choshu, the party's um, uh, policy journal, and so forth. Uh, Xinhua, uh, People's Daily, they are still as important as they ever are. They, their job is to convey uh, the regime line uh, on uh, any particular topic, and those are the place to go to practice this kind of method. Other media, People's Daily uh, publishes, also uh, publishes uh, Global Times, um, Wancho uh, Shirbal. Um, uh, pay attention to People's Daily, don't pay attention to um, uh, Global Times. They serve different purposes. And so uh, spending time trying to um, uh, dissect uh, the media presentation methods and um, 
um, uh, uh, Global Times is going to provide different insights than you might get from using uh, analyzing people's daily. The situation, I would see somewhat similar uh, to the situation in the later 80s in the Soviet Union and trying to understand Soviet affairs in the period of, of Gorbachev's glasnost. Uh, and so uh, there uh, is a brilliant analysis report that showed uh, back in uh, the late 80s or early 90s that the traditional method of criminology applied every bit as well in understanding uh, those issues that were of critical affairs to Moscow versus the uh, information now available openly uh, in Soviet, to the Soviet public in the changes in Soviet media. I think the impediments to um, uh, applying this method these days, first of all, are a major reorientation in the study of uh, contemporary China as a consequence of the new avenues of uh, access to China since the late 1970s. There's been a withering away of interest in leadership politics and things like that in favor of a much more interesting and profitable or accessible topics like the study of society locally and otherwise uh, and so forth. And so uh, the uh, method simply has been um, uh, forgotten, uh, I think in large part. I'm impressed by how few people still are around to do it. Uh, just, just one comment. I, a while back, I read Liz Economy's new book, um, uh, which a book I like very much, but her main chapter on politics in the Xi Jinping period drew almost entirely on Western media reports, not on Chinese uh, media sources or documents. And so I think that's uh, uh, Liz's book is a good book, but I think it just shows the kind of tilting of the way of the field away from traditional methods in favor uh, of others uh, since uh, since the 1980s. The other problem, I think, is there isn't an agency like the old FBIS to sort through the ocean of materials and to gather together the materials relevant to uh, topics um, uh, that might be of interest, in this case, to the American government. And that's a real problem, I think. Um, there is movement these days uh, to try to bring back an agency like that, given the enhanced uh, interest in China uh, these days as a concern to the United States. So there are real impediments to implying it, but I think uh, the, the validity of the method um, is uh, just as um, uh, useful as it was back in the good old days. Back to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Alice. That was terrific, obviously comprehensive. Um, I will not do anything as broad as, as you just did. I do wanna to try to um, uh, talk a little bit about how this works on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Um, just a minute, I'm trying to find, oh, there. that's where my, oh, just a minute, I've got my, PowerPoint up, but I've lost the, uh, just a minute, I have to go back here to bring it up. Okay, I, here it is. There, okay, um, let me, just a few things from um, my sort of experience with dealing with the media. Um, I think the first thing is, whoops, sorry, um, is, um, oh, I, I thought I had another slide up here. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, you know, why do people misread the Chinese media? And this happens all the time, and you can find examples of this uh, more or less uh, daily in the, um, in, in the press. Um, and the biggest sin, which I think Alice has referred to, is that uh, there's a real hierarchy to the media. You can even go into uh, the Remen Rabal site, or, um, and it will have a list of editorials, commentator articles, and other types of specific articles. And you need to pay attention to that hierarchy. So uh, that will help you define what is authoritative and what is not. Um, uh, or maybe I should say more authoritative and less authoritative. Um, I will say that the non-authoritative media, as I'll explain in a minute, 
can be very important. In fact, it can be more important than the authoritative media, but you need to figure out why that's the case. The example that I would apply, start with, is the uh, start of this important debate uh, on the criteria, practices of criterion or sole criterion of truth. Uh, this was, we know now, a uh, discussion that was started in the party school and a lot of people contributed to it. Uh, Sun Chang Zhang, who unfortunately passed away recently was probably the main contributor to the article. But if you're simply looking at the Chinese media on a day by day basis, you don't know any of that. That's all internal discussion. The first sign that you get is if you happen to pick up your copy of Guangming Rebao on May the 11th, 1978, and you see an article by a special commentator, uh, Tuya Pinglun Yan. Uh, and you say, boy, that's an interesting article. Don't know what it means. But then you see that it's reprinted in People's Daily the next day under the same uh, special commentator authorship. And you say, hmm, getting a lot of um, reprint here. This must be interesting. So the first thing you do is you go back to your files and you see if you can find any articles by the special commentator. And you say, no, I don't happen to see any files with this, uh, with this special commentator. Um, so this is something unusual. I better pay attention. Uh, you probably don't know, but if you, that if it is a authoritative article, an editorial or a commentator article, it has to go through Wang Xiaodong, who was the, at the time the, um, uh, actually he was head of the general office, not of the propaganda department, but he was in control of ideology. And if you were gonna write an editorial or a special commentator article, it had to cross his desk. So what's going on here is that they're putting it out as a special commentator so it doesn't have to go through Wang Xiaodong. That is to say there are loopholes or there were loopholes in the Chinese system. Uh, so as an analyst at the time, all you can do is say, well, that's kind of weird. I better pay attention to it. So you put it on the top of the pile. And if you're a serious China analyst, you have lots of piles that comes with it. Um, Alice uh, said you have lots of files. You should have lots of files, but sometimes you just end up having lots of piles. At any case, uh, you've just been paying attention to this and less than a month later, th three weeks later, Deng Xiaoping gives a speech at the All Army Political Conference and he strongly supports practice. And you say, bingo, this is important. Um, why is it important? Let me just see that. Um, the fact that Deng Xiaoping gives this speech at an all army political conference and that it's reported extensively in People's Daily the next day, um, it's gonna tell you, first of all, that Deng Xiaoping, then a vice premier, uh, strongly supports the criterion of practice and that the army supports Deng Xiaoping. Politically, that's extremely important. Um, you, there's obviously a lot that you don't know on, uh, don't know, and the odds are that you're simply gonna guess incorrectly. Um, but you can figure out before too long that practice is a challenge to the two whatevers. Uh, you know, the, the two whatevers, of course, is a reference to an editorial that appeared in People's Daily in February uh, 1977. And what we do know now is that that editorial was really not intended to hold Deng Xiaoping or other veteran leaders down. What we now know, but you wouldn't know then, uh, was that Deng Xiaoping was in fact picking a fight. He was challenging the ideological foundations of the Hua Guofeng regime. Uh, you could know simply from what you're reading in the press, 
that there's a big fight going on. Um, but you wouldn't know that it was really Deng Xiaoping who was uh, picking that fight. So the bottom line here is that if you're doing contemporaneous analysis, looking at the media day to day, you're gonna miss a lot. Uh, still, you know that there's a fight going on. You see some people um, supporting the practice of, criteria, uh, of uh, the criterion of practice. You see other people talking about uh, following Mao Zedong thought. Uh, you probably see other people not saying anything. Uh, you probably don't know that there is a work conference that's happening in uh, November. Certainly that wouldn't have been reported in any detail. But then you finally get to the third plenum in December 1978, where publicly the uh, two whatevers is criticized uh, and the principle of the criterion of practice is celebrated. You see the party changing the emphasis of work from class struggle to economic construction. So you can follow at least the, the um, outposts here. Uh, I think that for you st students uh, trying to develop this, uh, your abilities as a understanding the Chinese political system, you can get a much more uh, complete picture uh, because you can, you know, you can read the contemporary stuff, but then you also can do uh, interviews or collect other materials uh, to get a much more uh, complete picture of what's going on. So over the years, you know, we've had memoirs or interviews that have appeared in the press. There are historical accounts. Uh, and so you really begin to get a much better, more complex understanding of how the issues come together and how power transfers uh, hands from one leader to another. And in this case, uh, you know, there was a I guess you have to call it a leadership struggle. Uh, one of Wang Guofang's nicest, uh, most charming aspects is that he actually gave up relatively easily. He could have, I think, put up a much bigger fight and uh, the inauguration of reform. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Uh, the inauguration of reform was inaugurated by Wang Guofang. Okay, you might as well say that. He has begun in his own way slowly to downgrade the emphasis on Mao's uh, ideology. He makes two trips to Europe, one to Eastern Europe, one to Western Europe. So it was really Hua Guofeng who began the opening up policy. Um, so, uh, and by the way, the, uh, the uh, what is it? The, um, what's called the Great Leap Outward is also started by Hua Guofeng and with full support of Deng Xiaoping. So the, the picture of what actually happens there is much more complicated than you would get out of the media. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read the media because it's important to know um, at the time when there is conflict and uh, how that conflict evolves. Whoops. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, if you look at the economic reform, there is room in the official Gongkai media uh, for, for debate. Uh, the, if you're reading the editorials, commentator articles, that is the authoritative position. But uh, if I recall, it was always page four was the um, theoretical debate article, and you would have different views within a certain framework. If you go to the internal debate, uh, NABU publications, you get more extensive uh, debate. The uh, scope of those debates is wider, but there are debates that are carried on in People's Daily, and particularly in more specialized journals like Economic Research, Jingji Enjo. Uh, that seemed to have been the favored uh, publication of reform-minded economists at that time. So you find um, a lot going on there. And I should mention also uh, 
uh, more specialized um, newspapers like Zhongguo uh, Nomin uh, Rebao, the uh, the uh, China farmers peasants uh, paper, which reported extensively on the ongoing economic reforms in that sector. Uh, then you get debates in Jingji and Zhou about things like ownership reform, price reform, whether the economy should be centralized, decentralized. There are people who are defending the role of state-owned enterprises, saying that they can reform appropriately. Uh, and so you have, even in the open media, you have a range of policy views on important issues. And if you pay attention to these, then you can compare the debate that is going on with the party decisions that come out of such important events as the annual economic conference. And then you can track more or less where the party is going in its thinking about economic reform. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you look at People's Daily or some of the other national newspapers that uh, Alice was talking about, you find that everything is part of a conversation. The hard part is to figure out who is participating in this conversation. Uh, so particularly at the time, uh, you would often have articles that would say, Momo Ren, somebody thinks this, and he is wrong. Then you have to figure out, so who is Momo Ren? I think they were a lot more open about that these days, but in the, in the old days, you really had to do a lot of digging to figure out who's arguing with whom and what position are they saying? Because there, you know, there is a premium on not speaking clearly. Uh, that just takes work to work through those ideas. The other point that I wanna make, which I think is relevant to people studying the PRC today, we're all using word searches. It comes with the field these days, but I would argue that it's not sufficient because it is a conversation. So word searches will take things out of context. So you say, gee, in 1986, there are X number of references to some formula, and three years later, there are more or less. But unless you're reading the articles that those references go to, um, you're not gonna understand why the number has increased or decreased. Or the Chinese have this terrible formula uh, habit of changing the TIFA, the uh, official formulation for an idea. So if you're in the, um, let's say in the late Deng Xiaoping period and you're trying to search Renmin and Rao for the uh, uh, next five years or something, uh, you know, you miss uh, the, uh, some of the TIFA that Jiang Zemin is using, or that when Hu Jintao comes in, he talks about the scientific development theory. If you haven't searched for that, you don't see it. If you're reading your paper on a daily basis, you do see it. If you miss it and do a word search, you're not picking up that Hu Jintao is criticizing Jiang Zemin for being insufficiently scientific. That to me strikes me as a, an important bit of information. Um, then things can get a little bit more complicated. What do you do with a newspaper like Shijie Jingji Daobao? I used to just love to read this newspaper. It was published out of Shanghai and it was the most reform oriented newspaper in China. And it really went way beyond anything that you could find in any of the Beijing newspapers. Uh, it really had far reaching thoughts on economic and political reform. Uh, it's not authoritative, but it's important. And in this case, sort of like uh, with the example of the uh, criterion on, of practices, the sole criterion of truth, it turns out that it's important even though it's not authoritative. Uh, and what you can measure somewhat subjectively is what I would call the heat, heat index. How heated is the commentary 
in this newspaper getting. And I can assure you that it was heating up very strongly in the spring of 1989. And that should have been more of a clue uh, than it was. Um, also, more on the margin of things. Uh, some of you probably know the journal Du Shu. I don't know if anybody reads it anymore. Uh, kind of a specialized journal dealing with literary issues. Uh, previously, Du Shu was a very liberal journal. And then in the early 1990s, Wang Hui and Wang Ping took over the journal and changed its orientation to what is generally referred to as the new left. Uh, and they would solicit articles from people that they would know. And you got a, a publication that was uh, really talking about, let me put it broadly, what was wrong with the, with the May 4th movement and with the new enlightenment movement. And the argument is that the old ideas on modernization were simply accepting wholesale Western definitions of modernization. And what we as Chinese intellectuals need to do is think about a different form of modernization. Well, these are, you know, you kind of look at this stuff at the beginning and you say, well, this is interesting, but it's, it's not very important, is it? I mean, after all, you have basically um, a few handful of literary scholars discussing uh, literary ideas. They're picking up on, you know, uh, Jameson and others in the West and um, these sorts of critiques of modernity. But following these sorts of ideas over time, you can see them expanding. You can see them coalescing with different ideas on say nationalism. And you know, in this particular case, I think you can see the articles or the thinking moving from the sidelines, marginal ideas move much more to the center um, as I think new left ideas did do. And uh, you know, to a certain extent, the Xi Jinping uh, regime, uh, kind of picks up on some of these ideas. And so you can trace these from an earlier stage to being much more important. Um, and let me make just a, a final point, which is simply that the media can be used for simply following personnel changes. Uh, you know, in other words, something factual. Uh, you know, as you know, every five years, there's a party Congress, there are important personnel changes, and you find these out first in the media, sometimes because personnel changes have been made before the Congress, and certainly afterwards they will publish a list of uh, the new Central Committee. And what it's, I think, really important to figure out after that is not just who is on the Central Committee, but which positions are they holding? You'll find, uh, for instance, a new party secretary now will always change the head of the general office. I think the head of the general office has probably become even more important than it used to be. But in any case, it's very important. So a new general secretary wants to have his own person in charge of the general office. There are also other critical positions. Um, I think the military is an obvious one. Uh, you know, the, the power ministries, if you will, state security, public security, um, pr propaganda organization. These are the sorts of positions that are very critical to uh, securing your own power and taking the party in a new and different direction. In any case, um, that's just my own very quick take on using the media to study contemporary politics. Thank you. So Alice, Joe, thank you so very much. This is, uh, there's so much to chew on uh, and the questions that we've been getting um, uh, in, in the interim have been really, really good. And uh, 
I, I think we're not going to really have time for me to moderate. Um, uh, you know, maybe we can carry on this conversation offline. I'll go straight to the questions. But before I do, um, one of the things that both of you touched upon is, uh, you know, this idea of um, kind of what can we do now? Um, you know, what we can, what we can't. Um, and I think that's a sub theme that runs through some of these questions. But I, I, I think um, especially the, the, the younger scholars among us, uh, and I include myself in that, uh, uh, would, <laughs> thanks Joe, uh, would uh, other, you know, would um, I think appreciate, you know, um, kind of a practical uh, take on, um, you know, on, on some of the answers to these questions. So let me just uh, hop, uh, you know, get right to them. And maybe what I'll do is I'll ask three at a time uh, to save us a, a little time and uh, um, see how, how far we go. And I'll, I'll more or less go in order. Um, so um, uh, one of the, um, so, and I'll shorten them. So one of the questions uh, was um, in terms of the kind of the dual internal versus open media system, is that something that is uh, specific to the PRC, or do we see analogs of that going back, uh, going back in time? So that would be one question. Um, another uh, is, um, is there some sort of a, um, on the internal side of things, is there some kind of a cachet um, that's, that's, that's used kind of internally as you know, having access versus not having access? And is, that, is there a, a kind of sense of, for lack of a better word, a sense of mystery for those who have, you know, uh, keeping the state somewhat ambiguous or, 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 or mysterious and therefore giving it a kind of strength? Um, another question that I uh, wanted to uh, uh, get to in this first batch is, um, can you talk a bit about China watchers who had experience in Taiwan? Uh, so either doing language work, working in the embassy, serving in the military, et cetera. And what percent of this community had a Taiwan experience? Uh, did this have any impact on their place in the hierarchy of China watchers, their, you know, their credibility, career trajectory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let, let, let me start with those three questions and then know that I've got a bunch more. Uh, what was the first one? Oh, the first oh, one was the, is there a historical analog? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah uh, I believe the Soviet Union had um, a somewhat similar system, uh, the, the three legged system that I've mentioned. Uh, and so it wouldn't be surprising the Chinese had one too, uh, given the Soviet input into the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I'm not aware of other systems. I would believe that the Vietnamese and the North Koreans do too. I just don't know. Um, in terms of other systems, I think one questioner asked, are there dynastic parallels? I don't think so. Um, I'm a historian by training. I do not do contemporary China uh, for love. I do it for money. Um, and so my real training was in Ming and Qing history. And in the Qing period, during the Kangxi reign, uh, and I, this is one of my chances to delve off into what I was really changed to talk about, there were two, uh, two memorial systems. Uh, one uh, was the general Tiban system. Uh, that conveyed information from the locales up to uh, the imperial court. And then a second one created in the 1680s uh, that was internal. Uh, the memorials in that system, the Zobun, uh, went directly into uh, the, the emperor's secretariat um, and you know, carried more sensitive information. But over time, um, um, it too also became co-opted by the bureaucrats. The, purposes of those systems were different uh, from the Nebu versus Kai media. There were no Gongkai media um, in, in Imperial China. Now these, the two systems I mentioned were bureaucratic systems that just had some different channels and for different purposes. So I don't think, at least in China, there are parallels for it. Now the second one, is there a status uh, that comes with publishing in the internal media? Um, no, I think it's quite the opposite. Uh, the two channels, the um, internal versus public had different purposes. And the point of the internal media is to give anybody with any standing the opportunity to voice their opinion. That didn't mean a man from the, uh, could walk in from the street and have his opinion voiced. Uh, but if you had any standing in the system and you had an opinion that was deemed important enough to be aired, you could be published in the internal system. 
that isn't true in the open media, uh, where control over access and who was published is much more um, um, a product of the political system itself. And so I, I recall one incident in the early 80s, 80 or 81, uh, at a conference that being presided over by Hu Yaobang, the general secretary, attended by Chen Yun. And Chen Yun piped up and said he wanted his opinion published in People's Daily. And Hu Yaobang, Hu Yaobang said, no, you can't do that. You can have it published in Nebu, but you can't have it published in People's Daily. Uh, and so here's Hu Yaobang talking down to Chen Yun, a man who's been on the Politburo since 1935, uh, telling him, sorry, bud, you can't do that. That's not the way the system works. And so there's no particular status that accrues, I think, from publishing in one system versus the other. And the where, where did Hu Yaobang end up? Uh, uh, well, he went and ended up in uh, an unfortunate place in 1987. What was the third point or third question? The third point was uh, Taiwan. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I would point out that the premier China watching post um, back in what I've called the ancient times wasn't in Taiwan, it was in Hong Kong. And the consul general uh, there was the premier, prime, uh, prime post, at least for Americans. You, know, you couldn't go to Beijing. Uh, and so uh, there were a lot of resources in the American consulate in Hong Kong devoted to watching affairs uh, in, in on the mainland. It was like Riga in Latvia for studying the Soviet Union back in the 20s and 30s before normalization. Um, now, I had Taiwan experience. I went to the Stanford Center. Um, I know Joe did too, uh, but I don't think it, it offered any particular cachet uh, or relevance. Uh, there were just a lot of officials who served in Taiwan who were China focused uh, leaders, you know, in the American system. Uh, that was where people got experience, unless you're old like Doak Barnett and Ralph Clough. Uh, Doak was born in Shanghai, grew up there, and Ralph served something like three terms in Nanjing before he moved to Taiwan. So, but I don't think there was a particular cachet um, attached to having served in Taipei. Yeah, I certainly had my Taiwan experience. I but the reason that I did was not that I was a China watcher. I was trying to understand the Guomindang in the 1930s. Uh, at that time, I was uh, more interested in, in the thought of Chiang Kai-shek than the thought of Mao Zedong. Uh, mm -hmm. In did, any case. Did I, yeah, ditto for me. I was there to study you know, Qing politics and try to learn Manchu of all things. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I, I did end up spending a total of three years in Taiwan. Um, and I've gone back to Taiwan uh, more or less annually since then, uh, uh, especially except for the pandemic years. Um, hope we can get back to Taiwan soon. Hope we can get back to Beijing soon. Uh, by the way, I, you know, I used to go to PRC, oh, at least two times a year, sometimes three. Uh, and, you know, I'm modestly optimistic that as COVID gets behind us, that we can resume those uh, contacts. All of us have some really deep friendships with people in the PRC. And uh, I, I, you know, we, it's gonna be hard, very hard, I think for young graduate students to go out and do field work. But I'm hopeful that both graduate students and scholars can go out, resume friendships and have reasonable discussions about a whole variety of issues. Um, I might take a, a different take than Alice on the cache question. What counts is whether some leader writes a comment on your article, whether it's Nebu or Gongkai. And I certainly have heard people brag about some, you know, something that Jiang Zemin or whatever wrote on their, their idea um, you know, I, I think that that is, you know, that's gold, you know, you, you, you get, you actually, I think, get monetary rewards for that. Um, go ahead, some more questions. Fascinating. And I'm sorry about the ambient noise. They're doing some drilling in the apartment next door. Um, let me fold these into um, in, into three three categories or so. So uh, one picks up on, on, on where you uh, more or less left off, Joe, and that is, um, kind of what are the implications for particularly younger uh, uh, scholars uh, being able to go into the field um, 
you know, and, 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 and do the kinds of things that we've, been, we've grown accustomed to. And I guess a larger question to that is how might that push us in a different uh, kind of methodologically in a different field? I mean, we, 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 uh, or a different set of questions that we would be asking. Um, uh, and I know that opens a can of worms about kind of disciplinary um, uh, 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 imperatives and all of that, but I think it's a question worth, worth uh, wrestling with. Um, another one has to do with uh, the, the, the consistency or divergence of national level uh, uh, press versus local press and it, presses and, and being able to compare, uh, see if there's any, any nuance, uh, nuance differences uh, between the two. Um, and I guess uh, a lot of questions also hinge around this idea of how has technology changed a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the ways in which you've mapped out how things were done, uh, as Alice says, in the, <laughs> in the ancient times um, uh, versus today. I mean, to, to, to what degree uh, do we have to kind of rejigger some of that or recalibrate some of that? And uh, I'll, uh, I'll mute myself. You shouldn't mute yourself because these are the questions that I know you're has, asking yourself. I mean, so much of your work has been done on really great field work. Uh, your book on water power, for instance, you know, you know, you can almost see you walking through the fields uh, of different parts of China, talking to local officials, talking to people in Beijing, uh, and certainly things like Don Mattingly's recent book on, uh, you know, these are wonderful books. And I think this is, you know, I think the area where China studies has made the most progress in recent years is sort of where the state meets the society. And that's going to be much harder to do. Um, you know, what Alice and I have been kind of describing is focusing much on elite politics. Uh, I suppose that's what, because what we have been doing uh, for a long time. Um, but I think you can, you know, I think, for instance, um, recent history and recent comparative history uh, is a field wide open for young people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a book that uh, is coming out that um, Joseph Turgian has done comparing uh, the Soviet Union with China at various different periods of time. And I, I think it relies a lot on both media analysis and memoirs that have come out and things like that. And of course you can go, I hope you can still go and talk to people, participants in some of these people, uh, some of these events. Uh, so I think that we may be headed in sort of that direction. Thanks Joe. A Alice, do you have... Um... Yeah, I think, um, as Joe says, topics that depend on field work and that kind of direct contact are going to be harder and harder to do and therefore um, just um, maybe not possible to do. And so topics are going to have to change. Uh, as Joe says, the methods that we've been describing were used by us as government analysts focused on national priorities in the American intelligence and policy community. Uh, and so they work there, but I would suggest they also work in other areas. I think Fred Davis gave a good talk on uh, how to do political history uh, using traditional methods. And these methods fit very well in that and actually even better now that you have memoirs and all sorts of other documentary collections and so forth to supplement and actually refine what you can learn from looking what's in the media. Um, so I think, as Joe suggested, some topics just aren't going to be practical, um, and uh, people will have to think more carefully about the resources and you know access that are going to be required to do what they want to want what they want to work on. Uh, no, Andy, your second, second, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Uh, Andy, you raised the question of technology, and there's all sorts of different methodologies that are coming out now, uh, and so you have one person doing sort of uh, networking technology, you know, you plug people into the little boxes and then you see who's related to whom and all that sort of stuff. Um, what I would like to see is somebody doing that and somebody doing what Alice and I described and seeing which methodology seems to work better in a particular situation. Uh, I don't mean this as, uh, you know, high noon and, uh, 
in <laughs> Cheyenne or something. But I, th I think we really need to think about methodology. Uh, for instance, uh, there's uh, technology uh, that you can put. So if you have peaceful evolution, what words occur within a certain distance of that? Well, does that work better or worse than the methodology that Alice and I are describing? I, I think we can do some sorting and shifting of these methodologies to see what works better. In fact, I think that would be a great dissertation topic. Boy, no kidding. Um, uh, I mean, that's that that's uh, um, you know that's looking at things at a meta level that I think could actually really have great practical use. Sorry, absolutely. Alice, we'll cut you off. Yeah, I was going to respond. I think your second question was on the relationship between uh, the central media and local or provincial media. Uh, yeah. Um, well, um, it has been, I think, consistently across PRC history, the fact that the local media are required to carry some of the content from central media. And so, for example, uh, when People's Daily published a particularly sensitive editorial, it was mandatory for the provincial newspapers to publish it as well. But they also published their own commentary. They had their own structure of commentary. They had their own content and their own practices that they followed. And the method applies equally well in studying the local politics of Zhejiang province or, or Guangzhou city or whatever. Also, um, um, it was it's useful to compare the way provincial or local media treat uh, national subjects uh, versus the way they do in central media. An immediate example was back in 2016, 16, I think it was uh, when um, Xi Jinping wasn't yet de designated the, the uh, core leader. And so there were provincial references that began to refer to Xi Jinping as a core leader. Um, and it was fascinating to watch which provinces did this versus which didn't. Uh, this was well before anybody was doing it at the central level. Also, there will be occasions in which um, some prominent topic will be treated in the central media and the provincial media will or will not treat it. And it's interesting to see which ones picked up on the central media and are falling in line with the center and which ones are going their own way, uh, either by giving it short shrift or ignoring it altogether. Uh, and so uh, I think this relationship between the center and the provinces and the locales is really important. Uh, and this, this is a good way to get at that. I did a paper one time on uh, the treatment of Taiwan uh, in Taiwan Yenzhou, which was the Academy of Social Sciences journal and a journal published in Fujian, in Fuzhou. I can't remember the name offhand. Uh, anyway, it was a provincially published journal. And Fujian is a sensitive province, obviously, for Taiwan affairs. And I compared the content in, the, in those journals over a four or five year period. And there was a very distinct divergence in the way they treated Taiwan. Uh, Beijing was tough on Taiwan on various issues. Fujian, which had business ties across the Taiwan Strait and so forth, was much more cautious and, um, and not quite so tough. And so uh, this kind of comparison of local versus center uh, can be quite ins insightful. As somebody who does a lot of work in the provinces, uh, that's, that's, um, that's, uh, it's good to hear. Um, yeah. So, you know, I guess we have, we've got a speed round and what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect a bunch of questions into one and actually reverse it kind of, um, which is to say, you've talked a lot about FIBIS um, and other kinds of sources that, that were compiled here in the, in, in the you know, in the U.S. government. Um, if you could dictate the best possible kind of, uh, kind of, 21st century version of that kind of uh, uh, that kind of information source. What would it What would it look like? What would it be? Well, I think it's complicated. One of the reasons that FBIS public daily reports went away was uh, copyright conventions. The Berne Convention. State Department lawyers decided that uh, FBIS translating and making public translations of, in this case, Chinese material violated the Berne Convention. And so we were shut down. Um, so that is a problem that will have to be overcome. It may be managed internally within the US government, but it doesn't do much good for the rest of us on the outside. Also, I think um, 
the range of topics that are accessible by media of various kinds these days is huge, just given the span of publications. And so I think uh, while there may be one central publication, uh, were that to be created that can manage the, the sensitive political and economic and prominent stuff of interest to policymakers, there's going to be smaller um, aggregations of people interested in the PLA or interested in foreign policy or whatever uh, that would uh, profit from that kind of translation and aggregation effort. Um, and so um, it's more complicated to do. I think probably, you know, um, uh, the internet makes it easier these days um, uh, to, to imagine circulation, something like that, but there's some barriers to it. Well, I side with Shakespeare, first kill all the lawyers. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm really serious. Something that is, um, you know, of national security interest that we cannot circulate publicly um, doesn't make sense to me. It just does not make sense. Um, I guess because I've been on both sides of the fence, I take seriously the idea of a conversation between government experts and those of us on the outside who might still have something to say. Uh, and if you withhold a lot of information from me and then say you don't know what you're talking about, eh, this doesn't do much for that conversation. Uh, so I, I hopefully this new center that may be set up will have much looser restrictions on those publications. Well, we're at time. I think those fighting words are the best uh, kind of the best note on which to leave um, it, it it mobilizes all of us to fight another battle another day uh, Alice Joe thank you so much uh, for for sharing uh, you know, your, your wealth of accumulated experience um, and oh one thing I forgot to this is the newest um, book uh, by Joe and uh, you know if you haven't bought it yet no um, go buy it now um, but in, in, in all seriousness, I really want to thank both of you uh, and uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation in some way, shape or form uh, in the weeks and months to come. So be well, talk soon. And thank you everybody for joining us. We had a really, really nice uh, participation rate. We, uh, and so I think uh, um, uh, you reached a lot of people um, who really needed to hear a lot of what you had to say. So thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Andy. This was great. Yeah. Stay well, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.